Let me tell you a story. All right, so go with me here to the year 1846. In the autumn of 1846, a 39-year-old European man, a biologist and geologist by trade, he crossed the Atlantic by request and with some grant money in his pockets. He crossed the Atlantic to give a series of 12 lectures on the plan of creation as shown in the animal kingdom. That was his lecture title, The Plan of Creation as Shown in the Animal Kingdom. And he was to give this lecture at the Lowell Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. And during his first few months in America, this 39-year-old European man traveled to, among other places, the city of Philadelphia. And there in Philadelphia, he met and came to admire Mr. Samuel George Morton. Now, at that time in 1846, our 39-year-old European man, having been raised in the old world and now making his first visit to America, he was a monogenist. He believed at that time that all human beings share a common origin and over time evolved into different varieties of the same one human species. So our guy in America, more specifically now he's in the city of Philadelphia, for the first time in his life, he experiences black people. Negroes, as we were called at that time. And in a letter to his mother, who was still back in old world Europe, he wrote about his initial encounter with black people. And here's what he wrote. It was in Philadelphia that I first found myself in prolonged contact with Negroes. All the domestics in my hotel were men of color. I can scarcely express to you the painful impression that I received especially since the sentiment that they inspired in me is contrary to all our ideas about the confraternity of the human type and the unique origin of our species. But truth before all, nevertheless, I experienced pity at the sight of this degraded and degenerate race and their lot inspired compassion in me in thinking that they are really men. Nonetheless, it is impossible for me to repress the feeling that they are not of the same blood as us. In seeing their black faces with their thick lips and grimacing teeth, the wool on their head, their bent knees, their elongated hands, their large curved nails, and especially the livid color of the palm of their hands. I could not take my eyes off their faces in order to tell them to stay far away. And when they advanced that hideous hand towards my plate in order to serve me, I wished I were able to depart in order to eat a piece of bread elsewhere rather than to dine with such service. What unhappiness for the white race to have tied their existence so closely with that of Negroes in certain countries. God preserve us from such a contact. That's what he wrote to his mother in 1846. So this 39-year-old European man who was so viscerally repulsed by his first sight and experience of Negroes in a Philadelphia hotel in 1846, this man's name was Louis Agassiz, A-G-A-S-S-I-Z. Louis Agassiz went on to establish and became the head of the Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard University in 1847. And it was during that same year, 1847, that Agassiz visited the American South for the first time. And he traveled there to give a series of lectures in Charleston, South Carolina. And it was there in Charleston that Louis Agassiz, for the first time, got to observe Negroes, Africans, black folks working in the cotton fields and in the cities of that region. And it was also around this time that his, well, not his, but the craniological research of Samuel George Morton began to more heavily influence Louis Agassiz he's thinking about the racial differences in human beings. And this shift in thinking led him to conclude that Negroes and whites were a physiologically and anatomically distinct species. So Louis Agassiz had effectively been converted from a monogenist into a poly genus. And Agassiz began to write extensively on the classification of the races on the basis of specific climatic zones or what was referred to as zoological provinces, where each race was endowed with attributes unique to their survival in that particular zone. 
So in his reasoning and analysis, Negroes were peculiar to the hot and dry zone, Caucasians to the temperate zone, and Eskimos to the Arctic zone. And the attributes of each of these races was unequal. Caucasians were superior to Negroes, to black folks. So in 1848, during the annual meeting of the National Academy of Sciences in Philadelphia, Samuel George Morton examined a South African Kosan, meaning being a member of the Kosa people or the Kosa tribe in South Africa. Some of you will know the Kosas by the clicking that they do in their speech pattern. So Samuel George Morton examined a Kosa youth named Henry in 1848. And he later commissioned a photo of Henry to be shot in profile for the sole purpose of comparing his African skull formation to that of Europeans. Now, that photo of that South African boy named Henry from the Kosa tribe is the first known phrenological photograph, meaning the study of the shape and size of the cranium. That is the first phrenological photo known to be in existence. And Samuel George Morton later gave that photo of Henry's portrait to Louis Agassiz as a gift. And a few years later in 1850, Louis Agassiz was once again in Charleston, South Carolina. He would go there every winter to lecture. So in 1850, he was there lecturing. And while there, he received an invitation from one of the great slave holding families in that region, a man named Robert W. Gibbs. And Mr. Gibbs invited Louis Agassiz to visit some of the prominent plantations in the area as an opportunity for Louis Agassiz to observe and document what he called pure races from Africa. And on those tours, Louis Agassiz began examining the bodies of African slaves who worked those plantations. And he selected slaves from the Igbo, the Fula, the Gullah, the Guinea, the Coromante, the Mandrigo, and from the Congo, those were some of the tribes and regions in Africa from which these slaves had originated. And Agassiz commissioned a professional photographer named Joseph T. Zeely, who had a studio in that area. Agassiz hired Joseph T. Zeely to photograph these slaves that he had selected from these plantations that he had been visiting. Now, this was around the same time of the development of the photographic technique called the daguerreotype, the daguerreotype. And the daguerreotype was a process employing an iodine sensitized silver plate and mercury vapor to produce a photographic image. And the daguerreotype process was introduced in 1839 by a Frenchman named Louis Jacques Monde. Daguerre. So in 1850, when Louis Agassiz commissioned the photographs of the slaves on those Charleston, South Carolina plantations, the images coming out of those photo shoots were 15 daguerreotypes. Now, for me, <laughs> these photographs are hard to look at, especially when you consider that Louis Agassiz portrayed all of his slave subjects, most certainly against their own free will, either completely nude as semi-nude torsos in full body or in fixed poses, either front, back or side profiles. That's how he shot them. And the names of those beloved brothers and sisters of ours, those slave ancestors of ours, their names were, and I speak these names with great respect and reverence. Their slave names were Alfred, Jim, J-E-M, Jack, and Jack's daughter, Drana, D-R-A-N-A, Fasina, F-A-S-S-E-N-A, and Renty, R-E-N-T-Y, and Renty's daughter, Delia, D-E-L-I-A. And I say they're hard to look at for me because they are degrading and humiliating, especially when I reflect on the fact that the women were made to let down their blouses to expose their breasts to be photographed. And the men were made to stand completely naked front and back to be photographed, all for the purpose of comparing their physical features to those of Caucasians to prove to the world through photographs that Negroes, black people, were an inferior people as compared to their European standard of beauty and intelligence. And those 1850 slave daguerreotypes commissioned by Louis Agassiz became a legacy piece for him as Louis Agassiz became one of the first scientists, if not the first scientist, to commission the use of the camera for the sole purpose of documenting racial differences. And Louis Agassiz went on to become a professor of zoology and geology at Harvard, and he founded the Museum of Comparative Zoology there in 1859 and served as that museum's first director. And he held that position until he died 
1873. And that museum, brothers and sisters, is still operational at Harvard University to this very day. 